the economic and community impact of zoos and aquariums, next on Economic Outlook. I'm Phil D'Amico. Whether we're exploring Michiana's business environment, our community at large, or covering the region's complex economy, Economic Outlook is where we explore the economy, education, manufacturing, and new business models. My job is to go beyond the numbers and corporate analysis as we invite some of the best experts to answer the hard questions that face our economy. This is Economic Outlook. A portion of Economic Outlook is underwritten by Northern Indiana Workforce Board and Partners for Workforce Solutions and by the Progress Club offering women of all ages an opportunity to develop lifelong friendships, challenge the mind, and work for the welfare of children and families. Hello, I'm Phil D'Amico, Director of Business Growth for the Chamber of Commerce of St. Joseph County and your host for Economic Outlook. Zoos and aquariums around the country generate significant economic benefits locally, regionally, and nationally, according to a new analysis conducted by nationally recognized economist, Dr. Stephen Fuller. Today we'll talk to experts from regional destinations to help analyze the results of this study. Joining us in the studio today are Johnny Martinez, the zoo director at Washington Park Zoo in Michigan City, Indiana. Roger German, Senior Vice President of External Affairs and Communications at John G. Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. And finally, Marcy Dean, Director for the Potawatomi Zoological Society in South Bend. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have you. These are, I always love topics like this. I always love going to the zoos and aquariums. I'm kind of a big kid, so I love, be interesting to find out about some of the, the great things you guys are doing. But I do want to throw some stats out at you real quick and then get you guys to comment. According to research, American zoos and aquariums contribute $16 billion to, a, to the economy, according to a recent impact study. So what does that say about the attraction potential of zoos and aquariums? And I guess maybe let's start with, maybe let's start with you, Johnny. Let's go there to start from the zoo perspective. What does that say? Uh, it says quite well. In fact, uh, with visitors coming to the zoo and stopping for gas, food, uh, attending their local uh, activities uh, along with the zoo, it's uh, very beneficial for the community uh, as such for having a zoo. Uh, regionally located. Yeah, we have two medium-sized cities here represented in Indiana. Maybe from the Chicago perspective, you and four million of your closest friends. What, <laughs> what does it do from uh, the perspective uh, around your region? Well, it's great for Chicago. I mean, the Shedd Aquarium and all the museums and other zoos that are that are in the city of Chicago contribute uh, greatly, as we talked about the economy, as well as culture, science, conservation. And I think what's really interesting about Dr. Fuller's information is the fact that we really don't get seen in the light of being those economic engines. So from being an employer mm -hmm. personally, as well as all those contractors and other construction projects sure. that we do, uh, then you got the tourism aspect. So when you start growing that out, many of us aren't seen in that in that light. And I think it's kind of exciting to people can recognize zoos, aquariums, and the role that we play within the economy. So. Yeah, we're going to get to some of those stats. I'm glad you brought that up. But Marcy, from South Bend's perspective, I'm constantly on the community. hear a lot of positive feedback on, on what you guys are doing. What does it mean? I mean, quality of life, people want zoos in their community, right? They absolutely do. And one of the first things that I tout when I'm trying to sell Potawatomi Zoo is the fact that it does bring a certain quality of life to our region. And I've had several large employers in our area make that comment. They, they use Potawatomi Zoo to bring prospective families in to work for their businesses because it does enhance the quality of life here and it offers an educational attraction as well as a conservation piece. So it definitely does enhance quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. Roger, I want to get your comment first on this. For each $1 of direct spending by zoos and aquariums generated, it, it gives back $2.80 in total benefit on average back as it relates to the total economy. Those are big numbers when you start looking at them. Well, they, they absolutely are, and that's what I think when you look at zoos and aquariums across the country, both, you know, both the fine zoos here and the, and the Shedd Aquarium, what we are able to do for the, for the economy, what we're able to do to keep things going, especially during this last recession. You know, many of us, I mean, we, we, we stayed open. We, you know, we really did a lot to you know, do construction projects, keep the economy going when, a, you know, when, when the time was right. The one thing that we suffered a little bit from, and that's why I think this, this uh, conversation is wonderful, is you know, that Congress a few years ago kind of picked on zoos, right. aquariums, golf courses, a few others with saying, you know, you're not going to get some stimulus money and didn't recognize the fact that what we give back 
from a dollar standpoint, our economic impact is, is significant. Um, and that's why, again, this study sure. and other things that we're trying to talk about, you know, really shows the role that we play. And I love what Marcy said, too, about that quality of life. I mean, here in, at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, we often have corporations that use our facility to court folks. We have the city who actually takes advantage of that. So, for instance, a few years back when Boeing relocated from Seattle, Washington to Chicago, we they rolled out all the Shedd Aquarium and all the other museums and zoos as places for cultivation. And it really, you know, said to this corporation, move to the city who has this world-class culture, zoos right. and aquariums. So, again, we playing that role as an ambassador is another key role. Well, and it's a great point, and you're doing an excellent job of setting me up on my next question, by the way, so that's <laughs> perfect. But, but, Johnny, one of the questions I was going to ask is, you know, when you look at that dollar eighty that comes back, you know, that's a huge number. Why is it that we have a difficult time looking, at whether it's federally or state, uh, funds to, to kind of help out because this obviously is a tourism draw. It's obviously bringing dollars back into the community, but yet it is a tough sell federally and, and statewide. Yeah, it's, it's it's amazing. I don't understand it myself, and I know a lot of us are in that same position. But uh, again, you know, zoos and aquariums do contribute. And again, it's, as Marcy said, a quality of life, the situation. Our little port chamber of commerce, they, they work hard in bringing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, attention to us as such and promoting us uh, through our own state legislature and things along these lines trying to emphasize the fact that we are beneficial to the community and we do serve a quality of life uh, to the residents of our, our uh, uh, adjacent areas. It's I, I don't understand it myself. Uh, are there I, other public private partnerships Marcy that need to be explored here? I, I do think okay. so, yes. And, and how difficult has it been for you in South Bend specifically, maybe not from a local level, but federally and even statewide to, to get some funds? I, I th and I, I think that part of it is that zoos and aquariums are oftentimes only recognized for their the attraction mm -hmm. and not for the True. educational aspect, the conservation aspect, and the other things that push forward to sort of grab onto that stimulus sure. money. And I know at the top level, AZA is fighting really hard to push that message and locally you know zoos and aquariums are fighting really hard to push that message we're not just an attraction we offer so much more and I think if we continue to push that message hopefully we'll be able to grab onto some of that money but it is difficult it is difficult to grab yeah, that money. You know, and I was going to say too one of the things that we sometimes I think are sometimes victims of our own success in many cases zoos and aquariums traditionally are run really well really well organizations I'm not mm -hmm. sure about my colleagues but you know we're a non-for-profit non 501c3 um, you know, we have a board. A lot of times, you know, especially government officials will mm -hmm. see us as, well, they've got a rich board. They've got all <laughs> these movers and shakers and CEOs. They must be, you know, swimming in cash. Right. Um, mm -hmm. They've done some of the right things. And many of us are pretty conservative and, and, and have, uh, have gone through the recession. Others. So I think sometimes that light happens, especially with elected officials. They know the good work we do for education and mm -hmm. conservation. They're willing to maybe fund those. But what we used to happen, especially in Illinois, is we used to all get capital money. So we could do those construction projects so that we could support our our operations. That operational money has all dried up and so um, not seeing that economic impact and the fact mm -hmm. that you know at the shed we didn't lay off anybody through that recession. Matter of fact we uh, embarked on a 50 million dollar renovation at the height of the recession, mm -hmm. but the, you know, the, the, the construction workers that we employ, the staff that we continue to employ, you know, we want to try to make sure that that gets out there and it's, um, you know, the philanthropy, or the philanthropy community is very good to us, uh, but we also do need some help. Well, let's talk about that real quick. The recession, um, it seemed like a lot of people stayed more local rather than travel. You would think that would bode well for local institutions like yourself. Did we see an increase in attendance when that happened? Uh, not really. In fact, we we do our marketing study by zip code, and what we do is compare that from previous years. Uh, I was surprised. I expected more regional, local mm -hmm. people to be attending, but no, we still had our tourist attractions, uh, visitors coming in from outside. And it amazed me. Uh, in fact, it uh, exceeded uh, expectations uh, that we had. But our our situation as we are located next to the lake at an actual tourist resort right. beach. So we get a lot of that following continuous, continually. Uh, and so again, you know, I expected uh, it to change, but no, it, it, it never, never changed at all. Impact on the recession locally here. Our attendance actually stayed somewhat flat, which I heard throughout the zoo and aquarium community. Our memberships though, continued to grow. And so I think what happened is, People stayed local, and instead of paying that gate once or twice throughout the summer, they purchased a membership and got more bang for their buck. And so even though our gate attendance was flat, 
our memberships boomed during the recession. Yeah, and what have you found from the membership standpoint? It does seem like that is a, a great revenue stream for individuals like yourself. It is, you know, we, uh, we still run about two million people a year at the aquarium, um, breakdown of our tourist folks who come, our local folks. Uh, but again, that membership component was, it was a very strong component for us because it gave folks that value, gave them the opportunity to come back. Um, you know, when you do two million people a year in a very, you know, uh, tight, uh, constricted building, right. a lot of folks may come <laughs> in for an hour and leave. So those memberships are, sure. uh, you know, are great to do. But yeah, we, we definitely saw, you know, kind of that stability and that two million mark uh, during the recession, which was great. Shifted a little bit to some more, a little more local, uh, but Chicago continues to be a destination. Oh, so we, we definitely saw a lot of those tourists who still came, especially those from Europe. I mean, you know, the dollar was hurting a little bit, mm -hmm. so they were, you know, buying cheap airfare and buying cheap hotel rates in the city. So we saw a lot of uh, some uptick in that as well. That's great. Any chance you can kind of rig those GPS systems on the two million and kind of force a misdirection? Or? <laughs> Absolutely. You got South Shore Line. <laughs> Come down here. It's right. taking me an hour and 20 minutes to get here. Glad to send them out. You know what's interesting? You guys have talked about a number of other things outside of the attendance membership realm, and I want to get to some of these things. You know, Johnny, you talked about construction. Um, that's a big issue. You start talking about creating jobs outside the zoo locally with construction and, and those kind of things. Yeah, we're ev ev con continually uh, developing out, and we have projects assigned uh, throughout the year. And again, we bring in uh, union workers, uh, uh, various types, uh, to assist us in, in all this construction and development. And uh, again, it, it helps out. One of the things I, I, I w wanted to reflect on also, one of the things we did notice was an increase of visitors from Indiana, mm -hmm. southern Indiana and things along these lines. It did increase our attendance. In fact, last year we had the best attendance ever. Uh, we're a population of uh, 32 to 33,000, right. and yet we had a 78,000 visitor within a six month period. So again, we were seeing, and it reflected in our, in our uh, stat statistics that uh, all these people were coming up uh, more so than from the surrounding areas. Yeah, and I think one of the other things, Marcy, we start talking about jobs and wages and those kind of things. I'm, I'm not sure people fully realize how many staff people it takes to, to work at a zoo. I mean, it's quite a bit. It's, it's obviously more than just you guys. So uh, talk a little bit about that maybe. It is, and as a matter of fact, we did a local economic impact mm -hmm. study with Professor Grant Black from IUSB. Sure back in 2008, 2009, and it was released in 2010. And as part of that, we came to find out that we created $2.7 million wow. in direct and indirect revenue in St. Joseph County and created 91 jobs. So and for a, a fairly small zoo, 91 mm -hmm. jobs and $2.7 million is huge. And that so, is huge. I mean, we can definitely say we have a direct economic impact as well as we create jobs. And, even more so during our construction projects to just reflect on what you said, we just built a million dollar North American River Otter exhibit during the recession, wow. during the fallout of the economy, and several local jobs were created from a construction standpoint during that period. And so I think definitely we have an impact on jobs in the community. Well, one of the, Illinois, one of the tops um, in the country in direct spending towards aquariums, zoos, and so forth, Indiana kind of middle of the road, what have you seen from just your just your organization alone with wages and so the, the you know the number of jobs people you employ? Yeah, we're, we're probably about 300 uh, full-time employees wow. um, that just are at Shed Aquarium. Then you bring in all of the contractors and other folks that are around. So that ripple effect. Um, we actually did a study with amongst the other 10 museums and, and Brookfield Zoo and Lincoln Park Zoo uh, recently, and I think the economic impact was about tw over 21,000 jobs that were related on our industry and over a billion dollars and just in, you know in, in tourism dollars uh, and the economic impact. Mm -hmm. So I mean, co collectively we've looked at it and said you know you know billion dollars in, in economic impact, 21,000 jobs you know relying on all of sure. us you know it's, it says a lot and again I just think that's a light that you don't look at all of us at, at, from uh, but it's but it's such an important light and I think people are starting to recognize that a little more where does and I'll get all of your thoughts on this where does social media uh, what role does social media play in this is it a, is it does it help is it are you guys involved in, in social media advertising uh, branding yeah to, to a point uh, we're we are a municipality so because okay. of that uh, we're part of the park department we do have a public relations uh, person mm -hmm. in the, that represents the park and we work closely with them and uh, they do all the promoting uh, mostly for the zoo and work uh, work along those lines the zoo itself is a separate entity within the park district but we still respond to the municipality the city of uh, mm -hmm. Michigan City but again uh, they go out and actively promote and, and uh, work closely with the uh, Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. the uh, uh, 
uh, convinced from Visitors mm -hmm. Bureau. Sure. Come. But uh, and then we we piggyback on just about all the promotions that are around uh, right. that are brought into the community. And it, it, I mean, Marcy, Facebook, those kind of things. I mean, are they are they helpful? We think so. Okay. We started a <laughs> Facebook page, the Society did, on behalf of the zoo about a year ago. We have over ten thousand fans or friends and we also Twitter and we found that it helps promote our special events. We hold a zoo brew fundraiser, right, an sure. annual fundraiser and it's helped sell a tremendous amount of tickets Facebooking it and Twittering it and obviously I've got a younger very energetic marketing and special events person who is on Twitter and Facebook all the time and so we have a huge following Facebook and Twitter wise it helps Potawatomi Zoo for sure. Well Roger mm -hmm. what's interesting I think there's a lot of advertising agencies a lot of organizations looking at that whole thing and, and trying to look at the buyback on, on something like that have you guys done any studies or informal studies on that? Yeah, we, we, have, we have a little bit, um, and we're, we're the same way. We've got our Facebook, we've got our Twitter accounts. Um, what we're trying to do with that is, is twofold. We're trying to build a community because mm -hmm. part of what we want to do is really enhance our mission. So we've been using the Facebook and Twitter accounts to really get our education messages out, get our mission out there to make sure that you know, people understand and really build this community around Shed right. because if you're invested in it at some point, then you're, then you're willing to invest in other ways. On that note, what we do is we also use those for you know, selling tickets. We use those right. for you know, kind of driving traffic to some you know, fundraising opportunities, you know, sponsor an animal, things along those lines. But, it, but, it, but it's been huge for us as far as, uh, we're, I think we're a little behind the curve at times too for being a large institution, but you know, we're definitely out there and um, uh, you know, it's definitely been beneficial for us. Yeah, I guess one other question then, uh, follow up on this is, do you guys know who your demographic is? Have you studied that one? And then secondly, have you had to target your marketing processes towards those individuals? And I'll start with you, Johnny. Yeah, well, yeah, we definitely do that. Okay. Uh, we, as I made mention, we do the zip code where we do the graphs mm -hmm. and showing where people come from. We concentrate on surrounding areas uh, that are close by with us: uh, East Chicago, Gary, mm -hmm. uh, Hammond, uh, places along these lines. And we actively uh, pursue with their chambers and try to uh, do special events with them specifically in mind. We're starting to do things along the lines of a, uh, uh, a Hammond Day at the zoo mm -hmm. and, and uh, try to bring these uh, more of these people in, into our sure. community. Well, Marcy, do we know who is who are individuals going to aquariums and zoos? Is, is there, I mean, can we look and say that this is the type of individual that you know we're catering to? I think so. I mean, it, and I think it, every zoo and every aquarium sort of looks mm -hmm. at it differently. I think we all know who our demographic is. Right. I always say when I'm asked, it's one to 100. I mean, children, sure. families, grandparents, right. and individual adults, students. And so we sort of do the same thing. We target events around our demographics. And I mean, mm -hmm. I could tell you, you know, our income base and, right. you know, who's coming and who's, you know, spending mm -hmm. and this and that. But I, it's very broad. Our well, demographic I mean, is very broad. Is, is it even worth spending time on this stuff? Or, or as Marcy said, is it one to 100? And I mean, do you guys have more of a targeted niche? Or? Yeah, you know, we, we do. And I think it really depends on each zoo. It also mm -hmm. depends on the market you're in. You know, we, we really drill ours down to about uh, moms 24 to 54, okay. you know, 2.2 <laughs> sure. kids, you know, have the golden <laughs> right, retriever, yeah. all of that. Right. So th that's probably kind of the sweet spot okay. from a marketing standpoint. So we really try to look at that. You know, out of the 2 million people a year that we do at Shed, uh, about half of them come from kind of the the, the local region mm -hmm. the other half are tourists so we try to look for those opportunities whether it's overseas whether it's working with you know airline magazines right. things along those mm -hmm. lines but that but that but that 24 to 54 moms with two kids is really really kind of that sweet spot and we really go after them as much as we can they're also the ones who are spending a lot of time on Facebook and other uh, right. other ways as well so that's really what our brand and kind of what our voice is about mm -hmm. But we don't exclude anybody either. And we're definitely doing programs that reach those toddlers, and then we you know have, have a senior day at some point too. So, okay. why did you look at me when you said senior day? I'm only 48, for God's sake. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but Marcy, when we look at you, you know when we talk about you know target markets and all those things, mm -hmm. do you tailor your exhibits to certain demographics, or or do you just look at what what's the latest and greatest? We don't necessarily tailor our exhibits to demographics or look at what's the latest and greatest. When we decided to build our North American River Otter exhibit, we looked at what we had, the space that we had available, sure. and the fact that we did not have any aquatic exhibits. And that was a demand. When we did our visitor surveys, people said, we want elephants, we want giraffes, we want aquatic type animals. Well, North American River Otters, both aquatic and fun and energetic mm -hmm. 
and you know not relatively inexpensive when it comes to zoo construction so right. we didn't we don't really look mm -hmm. at the demographic or look at what's latest and greatest we look at what fits us what fits right. Potawatomi Zoo and our need and what our visitors are asking for yeah and Johnny what's interesting I think a lot of you have kind of referred to it a couple of times but the educational value of this and the in the educational opportunities it would appear that there is a huge educational component here. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yes, in fact, uh, we have an outreach program that goes within the 75, um, 75 mile radius. We take whoever has the need to know, whether it's the retirement homes, hospitals, children's schools, uh, groups, civil uh, civic groups, and uh, we go out and pr promote using animals as tools, education tools to promote interest in the animals themselves and the uh, dwindling wildlife situation, and also to uh, give people a, a chance to uh, get educated about these types of things. Uh, we, it, it's it's part of the zoo's core, and our aquariums also is part of our main uh, mainstays is education, recreation, and conservation uh, themes. But uh, we really uh, cater to anyone that has need to know. We have special event programs that are strictly educational, mm -hmm. and uh, we, you know, we cater to that aspect. It's it's really an important part of the zoos and aquariums. Have you seen the same thing, Roger? Yeah, no, it's uh, education is definitely our core, as Johnny said, mm -hmm. and for for what we do, we we have. Uh, a program at Shed where if you're, uh, you know, school groups come before 10:30, you got to register, but uh, get in for free. So we've got three, wow. 300,000 kids come through our doors every year. Um, just, just from a school standpoint, we've got an education department which mm -hmm. can take it to that next level, whether it's you know dissection or other kind right. of STEM science projects, and then we have the outreach program too. Because you know, really at the end of the day, it, it, it ends up being about that. It's it's the young folks. It's it's getting an education, and I think they said late 2009 was the first time kind of in human history that mm -hmm. more people live in urban settings than rural so that disconnect for nature and especially in a city the size of Chicago that disconnect is huge so getting those kids at a young age getting them inspired about animals getting them inspired about the environment is critical um, so that's where we definitely have seen some sure. philanthropic support we've seen some government support to help those education programs because they're critical to our mission well we've got about four or five minutes left I, I really want to give you guys a chance to talk about maybe some of your exhibits on the horizon for the fall maybe winter and into early next year Marcy what what are you looking at from Potawatomi's standpoint? Well, this has been the year of the otter. Since <laughs> we opened our North American River Otter exhibit in the spring. And so we are just concentrating on next steps. Currently, we do not have a master plan, so we are going to start working with some firms to mm -hmm. come up with a master plan and look at the future. And one of the, the swings is zoos and aquariums sort of bringing in both the animals as well as the attractions because they generate revenue that can go back into the zoo. So we're looking at both. What's our next attraction? What's our next animal? Mm -hmm. yeah. So just planning for the future. Yeah, and Johnny, I know you've got a new primate exhibit coming up. Uh, we're, be, we're working on a, a primate exhibit, but right now for this year, uh, the month of September, we're going to be opening up a new uh, fruit bat uh, exhibit, a free flight exhibit. Uh, we have a, that's located in our new animal resource building. Okay. The, uh, we're building an additional classroom onto that. To, we're uh, putting more uh, handicapped handicapped restrooms onto that facility. So that's our focal point for this year. And this month we will have the uh, fruit bat exhibit and then uh, we'll also doing more educational uh, types of exhibits in the uh, animal resource building. Yeah, Roger, what, what's on the uh, the shed aquariums list, I guess? Yeah, the shed, it's the year of the jellies, so the sea okay. jellies. So we opened up a temporary uh, exhibit on sea jellies earlier this year as well. It'll run through Memorial Day of next year. But one of the things that we did is we uh, surveyed a lot of our folks. So we've had some sea jellies in some of the some other areas in the aquarium and realized it was an extremely popular uh, uh, exhibit. Wanted to make sure we use it kind of from a marketing and economic driver, um, especially with all of us with, with animals that we've cared for for a long time. You know, it's, it's, you can't move animals in and out all the time. You can't move a beluga whale right. and change that out. <laughs> right. So we look for special exhibits. So special exhibits about the sea jellies. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. We've got 12 species of jellies that are there, and it's a, it's a chance to come and kind of see these underwater creatures that no brain, no blood, no bones, and right. it's just it's a pretty amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing exhibit. So. Well, I do want to, we got two minutes left. I want to get your final thoughts on uh, how do we get the word out that this is a, a you know a key economic driver in our community. Marcy, I'll start with you. I think just marketing and messaging mm -hmm. is so important, and just selling the story, the educational story, the conservation mm -hmm. story, and you know what we're good at, what we're great sure. at. 
And Johnny, you've been in the, the business, I think you said 38 years, so you're kind of a rookie at it, I guess. What, what a, I mean, how can we get the word out that this is an important economic driver for our, our communities and our regions, really? Basically, look with our, work with our local entities, our Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. work with our Convention Visitors Bureau and uh, the, the local media, and get this information out that uh, what uh, zoos and aquariums uh, uh, create and establish for the community uh, residents and uh, what we are all about. Roger, do you think the community actually understands the economic impact? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think some of them, they probably do tangentially, but yeah, mm -hmm. realistically, deep down, and, and as my colleague said, sure. I mean, it's all of those methods that we have to do, take advantage of opportunities like this, you know, try to get that word out. But at the end of the day, as much as we sell that story, remaining corridor, a mission of conservation, research, education, that will keep, right. that'll keep us going sure. no matter what down the road. And I think as long as we stay core to there, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. Well, it's a great discussion. And really, congratulations on the success of your organizations. I think, Marcy, you talked about quality of life. It's really critical to have some of these things in our community when you attract businesses and so forth. And I think you all did a great job ex expressing the economic value that we have. And uh, I love, I'll, I have not visited yours yet. I will promise you I'll get there, but I, <laughs> I have visited yours too. And, and we look forward to the, seeing some of the growth projects down the road. So thank you. That's it for this edition of Economic Outlook, the show that puts focus on key business, education, and community elements that drive our regional economy. I'm Phil D'Amico. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Economic Outlook. A portion of Economic Outlook is underwritten by Northern Indiana Workforce Board and Partners for Workforce Solutions and by the Progress Club offering women of all ages an opportunity to develop lifelong friendships, challenge the mind, and work for the welfare of children and families. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.